Hello everyone, uh, we're here at CES on the first official day. Uh, my name is Jamie Rigg, I'm a London based reviews editor for Engadget and I'm here with Emily Warren of Lime. Uh, Emily, tell them your job title because I've read it about five times and I could not remember. No problem, so. it's a mouthful. I'm the Senior Director of Policy and Public Affairs for Lime. Cool. To everyone that doesn't uh, know Lime, um, do you just want to give them a brief uh, kind of recap of, of what Lime does? Sure, so Lime is a smart mobility platform. We operate free-floating bikes and scooters and we launched in June 2017. So just a little under two years ago, we got started with regular pedal bikes. Um, our first big city was Seattle in the United States. Right. And we were moving along with bikes and introducing electric bikes and then scooters happened. And I think it caught us and a lot of people by surprise just to see how strongly the market really resonated with this brand new form factor mobility device that most of us might know from our childhoods as, mm -hmm. as a toy, now all of a sudden has become something that is actually a practical way that people are getting around cities and you add a, an electric battery to it and it is incredibly convenient and easy to use. And so we really scaled up our operations over the last year with the tremendous interest that we started to see of participation in the scooters specifically and, and that right. brought investment and it's brought expansion. We're now in over 100 cities around the world, 15 countries and we just actually announced today our 10 millionth rider, which was an exciting oh, milestone for us. So that's a lot of expansion in one year. And now we're, you know, we're really doubling down on building out a very high quality product that we know is going to allow us to continue to be best in class, not only in, in the size of our operations, but in the user experience and in the safety with which we operate in the cities um, where we have partnerships. What do you think it is particularly about scooters that people are really uh, kind of connecting with? Mm -hmm. I mean, do you think it's just the fun factor or? I do uh, think they're fun, yeah, but yeah, I also yeah. think that it's practical. They're very lightweight. So for someone that isn't accustomed to riding a bicycle and you know maybe isn't sure how to adjust the seat to make it the right height for them to ride, um, or might even be wearing a dress like me, I think it's easy for them to step up into that low platform. Just jump on and go. Just, kind just of, hop yeah. on it. You can keep one foot on the ground as you learn how to, how to get it started. And it even kind of gives you that opportunity to put your foot down if you're um, you know, if you want to slow down. So people feel a sense of control. A very large percentage of folks right, actually yeah. are not cyclists at all. This is something that they're coming to for the first time. Many of them switching away from something like taking an Uber or Lyft vehicle. And as we see cities becoming more and more concerned about congestion on city streets and about pollution and carbon emissions, they're gravitating more and more to being able to give folks an on-demand transportation experience that doesn't contribute to any of those kinds of, of challenges that cities face. Uh, talk me through how you go from June 2017 mm -hmm. launching uh, you know, dockless bike sharing scheme to being all over the world with electric vehicles. The behind the scenes operational aspect of this is fascinating. And I, I did work at Lyft for five and a half years before this from the earliest days of the company. And it's so right. interesting to think about that experience and the trajectory of that industry compared to what we're seeing now with scooters and bikes. Because on the surface, it can look really similar, right? There's an app, there's an on-demand transportation option, you're using it maybe in similar places. But behind the scenes, it's an entirely different kind of a company because we have to actually build hardware, you know, have yeah. a supply chain that takes a, you know, many months in order to design, build, and manufacture, you know, import to the, to the operating markets and, and get those on the street. And then of course, there's the whole operational footprint of our teams, the local employees that we have in every place that we operate and yeah. the networks of folks that engage with us to assist with charging operations for scooters. It's an extensive footprint that actually makes that work. And it means that we have a stake in all of these local communities and we're engaged with them and um, actually you know, working on the city streets. We have eyes on the street every day of our own team members that are out there you know, responding. If somebody says, hey, a, a scooter's in the wrong place, we've got somebody there in a couple hours, maybe less, that's picking that up, putting it somewhere else, making sure the supply is where it needs to be so that when you get off the train at five o'clock, there's a scooter waiting for you to yeah. get you that last mile. So that level of operational expertise is something that we've been able to, to refine substantially over the last year and build out what I think is the most sophisticated um, free-floating operational model and you know, certainly in the largest number of markets in the world. Uh, now we want to grow that and actually make these presences that we have in local markets 
markets um, a, a meaningful part and a meaningful scale of people's uh, travel activity. How do you see, um, you know, a, a smoother road to uh, regulation and working with um, councils and stuff in the future so um, everyone can mm -hmm. kind of be in that space, the users get access to them, mm -hmm. it's safe, everyone's happy. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, and given your job title, that's kind of what you what you that work That is my in, wheelhouse. Right? So yeah, um, yeah. how do you see that evolving? Because at the moment, mm -hmm. we're still figuring it out. There's a lot of controversy yeah. around, um, around uh, throwing around blame, mm -hmm. you know, between companies and and, uh, and authorities and stuff. So yeah, talk me through that a little I bit. I think the this early, you know, first to third year period of a new industry's life cycle is always the hardest, especially when you're working with a business model that requires such close um, and partnership with the city, but is also demanding rapid change from cities. Governments are, um, they're entrusted with a solemn duty to protect the public, and we respect that a great deal. And we know that they need to be responsible, they need to ask all the hard questions, and we want to answer those questions for them and work with them. But we also want to challenge them to think outside the box and realize that just because they don't already have a program uh, for this doesn't mean they shouldn't have one. It doesn't mean that their communities wouldn't benefit from it, right? So the onus yeah. is on us to come in and demonstrate how we can provide those benefits, show them the data, be transparent in documenting the benefits that Lyme can have by providing examples from other markets where we currently operate. And we find that that really helps unlock the conversation. And that in fact, in most cases, cities are already looking for solutions just like this. Many large cities have been working for years spending taxpayer dollars to build out bike sharing systems that have yeah. sometimes just not been able to achieve their full potential, not achieve the vision that a city might have for trying to reach all communities and actually offer something that could move the needle on reducing reliance on car ownership. And there's hope now that dockless services like Lime with our bikes and scooters can help to fill that gap. And because we are operating on more of a free floating basis, we can be successful in neighborhoods that docked bike sharing was never able to serve. How do you foresee kind of com competition in, mm -hmm. in the market and uh, you know, how do you rise above that, I guess? Yeah, there, a lot of companies have noticed that scooters are a great business and are getting into this. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we, are, we appreciate our position as a market leader now and we know that in order to retain that, we do have to stay ahead of the curve in terms of product quality and experience. We, we have the resources to be able to bring the product to the street um, in, the, you know, in the largest volume, in the largest number of places, but it needs to be um, a really high quality experience for people to want it and for cities to really want it on their streets. So this Generation 3 scooter is something we're really proud of. Um, we actually have a very large internal hardware team at Lime. A lot of people might think, oh, hey, you're just buying these scooters off the shelf from some, you know, some company overseas. The reality is we have a huge number of engineers and designers that work at Lime um, taking the product feedback that we've heard from our riders. For example, we now have this two-sided front suspension on uh, the Generation 3 scooter. That is going to help smooth out all those bumps in the pavement that scooter riders might experience when they're going over uneven asphalt. And that was something that came through from our riders in, in our first few iterations of scooter hardware. Um, the longer range obviously helps people take longer trips and gets through the entire day, even if there are a lot of different riders using a scooter during the day. Um, it's, a, it's a heavier weight device and it's fully encased so that there aren't any exposed wires that would be susceptible to vandalism or to damage from being yeah. outside, uh, you know, beaten by the weather from day to day to day. This is really a tank when it comes to, to scooters that are built for shared use. And it also incorporates a display screen that will let you navigate to where you're going um, oh, just by looking okay. at that little screen. And that is another feature that we take seriously in thinking about how we can improve safety so that people are never tempted to look at their phones while they're riding to get where they want to go. Uh, we have front and rear braking as well that kind of provide that redundancy and greater stability in the braking experience. So all of these learnings are things that we were able to incorporate based on having uh, been in the market in a you know, large number of places with a lot of observations of what's happening on the street. That's going to be something we, we continually try to stay ahead of in this competitive landscape. Um, but you know, to get back to your point about saturation, I hope that's the biggest problem that we have. Right, I think, right. you know, 
for, for right now, um, you know, working with cities, we need to, to scale up our operations. There's a huge untapped market that isn't even close to being saturated yet. We are seeing the demand signal from consumers that want to use this product. And now we need to create the next phase of city partnerships that will allow our supply to flex up to meet that full demand and, and fulfill its potential. Right. Emily, thank you very much My for pleasure. coming to talk to us. And um, I was in Warsaw not that long ago and I had a blast. We all explored the city on limes the whole time. Uh, and that isn't a plug, it's just a fact. We had a <laughs> really good time it. on them. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much for, for joining me. And uh, thanks for watching everyone out there as well. Uh, stay tuned for more um, great stuff from CES. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thanks.